have a cigarette and a beer, you ain't going nowhere. Welcome to the power movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week we have a business episode. My guest is sports agent Ryan Runke, and we talk about how the hell he's done all that he has in his life. Ryan took the non-traditional route to finding success in the world of snow, and he's had some amazing jobs along the way to becoming an agent. And when I say agent, don't think of Jerry Maguire. The only thing Ryan Runke has in common with Tom Cruise is that he's one of those guys that you either love or hate. There aren't too many people in the middle with Runke, and most people love him. Before we get into the show, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram, at The Powell Movement. And speaking of Instagram, I'm going to be running a bunch of contests on the gram this season. Make sure you look at the image I put up each Monday to find out what you need to do to enter and win. If social media contests aren't for you, don't worry. There's more. You can sign up for my number two's letter on my website, and that will get you entered for a drawing of spy sunglasses. I will do that drawing on November 1st as well. So if you didn't know, Spy is a sponsor of the show, and I need to thank the rest of my amazing sponsors. They are Evo, Rescue Water, Outdoor Research, and the 10 Barrel Brewery for making the show happen. Please use the codes in the ads to save some money on things you're going to need this winter. And now, let's talk to Ryan Runke. So life of the sports agent allows you to work from home a little bit? My life as a sports agent means I work from home 100%. I do not go to the office. I have an office in my house. And home for you is? Redondo Beach. I know that we have a hard stop. Yeah, I have a hard stop in 45 minutes. Then I'm going to jump right into it and we might skip inappropriate questions because your career, you've done a shit ton of stuff. We know each other from K2 days and have seen each other around since you left K2, but You're a sports agent. You've spent a lot of time as a team manager in the world of snowboarding. And before we even talk about your snowboard career, we're going to talk about your life and times and how you kind of got into the snowboard world. Your younger life is a mystery to me because no one's really writing articles on the sports agent and where he grew up. But I do remember, I think you were from Kansas. That is correct. Do you spend your whole childhood in Kansas? The greater part, like from four years old to about... 16 or 17, I moved to Colorado when I finished school. Parents stay together. Do you guys have money? What was the, the life like for a young runkie? I grew up in suburbia, straight up. Mom and dad, one sister, nice house, nice neighborhood. I was a full ticket jock, actually. Like a team sports jock? Team sports jock, played competitive soccer since I was like six years old. By the time I was like 10, I was on the junior national team and on the traveling club team, and we won multiple national championships. And I was on varsity as a freshman going into high school, starting varsity as a freshman. After my freshman year, I was already recruited by Creighton University to go play soccer there when I graduated high school, three years out. Granted, so I'm 15 at the time. I'm training with you know, 19, 20 year old, 20 year old men. And I cut and I blew my knee about 45 degrees inwards. That was it. It was over. And this is amazing to me because anybody who knows Ryan Runke these days or has seen Ryan Runke probably since 2000, you look the opposite of anybody who would play team sports. If I were to look at you, I would think you were the kid growing up that would want to punch the coach and say, fuck you. But you were fully engaged in team sports. Just soccer. But yeah, fully engaged in team sports. Did you do anything else other than soccer? Was there skateboarding or skiing or snowboarding? Because I think you're probably around 40, 42, 43-ish. Don't date me, dude. I'm 39. Sorry, man. (laughs) Honestly, I didn't pick up a skateboard or a snowboard until I was 15. After I blew my knee apart, when I first recovered. Because I blew my knee apart and I tried to continue to play soccer, but I wasn't at the level, like at that national level anymore. And so I just... The frustration set in. If I, if I wasn't going to be at, play at the level I was used to playing at, it was over, you know? Like, if there wasn't a future for me, it was gone. So at that point, when I started to get better, my knees started to get better, that's when I picked up a skateboard and a snowboard all in the same year. And I mean, we had a small resort in Missouri, like an hour from my house. And yeah, that's kind of what led to, without me blowing my knee that first time, my, my life path would have been totally different. When soccer ends for you, you just crushed because that's what I'm guessing your whole life's all about until you blow your knee. Mm-hmm trying to figure out what to do. Is that how skateboarding comes into the picture? Yeah. I guess like everyone else in that era, like this is 
like 94 or five or something like that, you know, like skateboarding was like a taboo thing. And there's like probably five kids in my school or around that skateboarded and that looked awesome. And so I started skateboarding, you know, same with snowboarding, right? The mountain local hill, there's like three or four of us that went every weekend. We thought we were cool. That's what we did. And we just loved it, you know? What did you look like at this point? Because I'm thinking Ryan Runke jock, but I can't get the picture out of what I know out of my head. So like in high school, what kind of kid are you? Are you like a punk rock kid or has that not started yet? It quickly switched over when soccer was over. I kind of turned into the little punk kid, you know, punk rock music and bad religion and that type of stuff was where my life went quickly, you know. And is there partying in Kansas in high school? Because I wouldn't think there's anything else to do other than sports and partying. There definitely is, you know, like it's Midwest, right? Like this is the middle of nowhere, right? This is the city. Like Kansas City is a big town, you know? I lived in a suburb just outside of the city. And actually the final school I went to was a alternative school, private school. So it was a lot more loose. It was actually downtown. I went like downtown and kind of the more, we'll call it ghetto area of Kansas City. A lot more open liberal school where, you know, it wasn't your traditional public school. I quit that when I was a sophomore and I switched to a different school because I just didn't like the, the public school I went to was very cut and dry, clean cut, you know, just suburbia bullshit. And after I quit playing soccer there and it was done, I got out of that place pretty quickly, you know? I just changed the group of people around. Like, I wasn't going to hang out at the McDonald's with the jock people and the cheerleaders. Just, they weren't my people, right? Right. And they never really were, I guess. I played sports. That was it. Like, I had a path to get my life somewhere and then that ended. So my path changed. So I no longer had to interact with those people. I guess that's it. So long ago, man. Totally. After high school, are there any plans for college? Do you go to college at all, or do you just go straight to Colorado? No, no co- no plans for college. I finished school a year early because I, I went to a private school, so it's really easy to they put you on a path to just test out. Like a lot of schools now with these kids, right? A lot of kids now, you can do independent studies or do it however you want. Mine wasn't that loose, but um, they allowed me to just rip through a year pretty quickly. So I finished after my junior year, graduated, and I moved to Colorado. My plan was just to go snowboarding. That was it. And what do your parents think of this? Because you grow up in suburbia, and I'm sure it's a decent life there. And I'm sure your parents thought you were going to play college soccer at one point, and they're all excited for little Ryan to go get his scholarship. And then little Ryan can't play soccer anymore. And then little Ryan's like, I'm not even going to go to college. I'm going to go snowboard. And I'm sure a parent isn't like, that's awesome, Ryan. No, my dad came from corporate America. I'm lucky. man. I got great parents, right? They've always stood by my side. I guess they just didn't understand it, right? They're like, all right, and but what were they going to do? Like, I was a little bit of a rebellious kid. Like, it wasn't like asking. It was I did whatever I wanted, right? And it wasn't I was a bad kid, but just I was going to do what I was going to do. And I think I kind of still in that same mindset today in my life, right? If you know me at all. Yeah. I'm going to have that I'm going to do what I want to do type of mentality. Yeah, it was a little challenging for them for sure. But they just at that point let me do it. My dad's always been baffled. That I've done what I've done or got to where I'm at. Cause I was like, once I got to Colorado a couple years later, I kind of had a plan to get into the snowboard industry. And we, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But he always was just baffled how I kept taking these steps to succeed to where, like, you know, I built a pretty good life for myself and part owner in this agency and just have built my own business and stuff like that. He's always really baffled that I got to where I was at the untraditional way. But I think now in today's world, I think untraditional is quite often, you know, a lot of people do it this way. But 22 years ago, it was not as standard. You're different in the untraditional sense, too, because you're such a big, I'd say, personality. I mean, because your personality has gotten you everywhere in your life, I believe. Like, people love the Runky, and that has helped you out significantly. I mean, you're smart as well, but your personality and lifestyle has kind of sold you, I feel like, into all your jobs. And you're always moving forward and We'll find out how these things happen because you moved to Colorado and I'm guessing it's just, hey, I'm going to snowboard every day. I'm going to party and live that lifestyle that I want to bleed for the rest of my life. Is that the first year there? It's just you're working at a shop and partying? Yeah, first year. I mean, I was 17 years old and I was there for a couple months. I didn't get a job. I had money saved up. And then I worked at like the rental shop, for the snowboard rental shop at Keystone. And this is like right when... I think right when Keystone opened snowboarding, I'd have to check the year, but like it's got to be 96 or whatever, but Keystone was just starting to open snowboarding, maybe been a year or two, like it's pretty new. And I got a job at the Keystone Snowboard Rental Shop and it was at the base of the mountain and we'd work shifts either like 
you know, KG work like, are a seven to three or something like that, but it was like seven to 11, then like four to eight or something like that. Or you'd work like one o'clock or 11 o'clock till six, seven o'clock. And the point was you could ride every day because there's night riding, right? You're open till nine. So you, there's always a minimum of four hours a day you can snowboard. And I think I snowboarded like 187 days the first year or something like that. Wow. When you're 17, you'll just ride in any condition, huh? You ride in any condition and you, six, seven days a week, you're at the mountain. Like if you're working, you would, we'd ride literally every single day at Keystone mainly. Occasionally we'd go to Breck or A Basin late season or early season. Like we would snowboard literally every day. And I live with like, I think three of us moved to this place in Colorado and by like a month later, two months later, maybe there's like five of us living there or something like that. And that only lasted for like February. And these guys come in to Colorado, they were from England and they had a company called Low Pressure Publishing and they had just arrived and they were doing a guidebook on snowboarding all across the country. There's multiple teams, five teams across the country splitting up the country to go to like all 90 resorts in North America or something else. That number of resorts. And for some reason, we met the guys. We showed them around Keystone because like they're right up the round shop, right at the base. So we'd show them around, and then they end up coming to my house to party with us. You know, typical life, flop house, Colorado. And they end up staying. And I'm sitting up the next morning, and I'm having coffee. And the guys like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "I'm getting a drink coffee. I gotta go to work. I'm gonna go shred." He's like, "No, what are you really doing?" I was like, "I, I just told you, like this is my life." And he's like, "Do you want to come with us and write this book?" And I said, "What?" He's like, well, not with us. We got a group of three, but every team needs a group of three. And we're the first ones in here, but we have a guy named Mark and this girl named Gina, this little photographer from New Zealand. And Mark's one of the owners, and he's like a six-foot-tall Rastafarian, like skate, snowboard guy. So they're coming in in like two days, and they're doing all of Colorado, all of New Mexico, all Arizona, all, part of California, all these resorts. And we need another person on the team. Do you want to come with us? We'll hire you to come just quit your job like today, and you've got a sweet truck. You can be like the local guy to kind of help us fit in and find these local people to show us around. So basically, they use my, what you, I guess you said, my personality to be the one to like work our way into every resort and every mountain town and really find the, the real stuff going on, you know? The who you hang out with, where do you really ride, where do you party, that type of stuff. And so I quit my job that morning <laughs> and I got in a car with two people I'd never met before in my life two days later and went on a road for three months. This is the North American Guide to Snowboarding? Correct. All expenses paid. You're 18 years old traveling with these dudes. Do you have to write anything or are you just the, the connection guy? I was just a connection guy. Like basically I was doing the research, right? I'm not a writer, but I'm with the writer and I'm with the photographer. So I, yeah, all expenses paid. Plus they paid me a little bit of money. And then when it was all said and done, they flew me to London for a couple of weeks to get to hang out with them when they were editing. You're psyched. Is that kind of what plants the seed of like, dude, I can do more than the shop life? I guess so. It was just one of those things. It was an amazing experience. And I was really young and it was cool to be a part of. And then I think I went to Europe and then I came back and I moved to Hood thinking I was just going to go live in Hood maybe forever. I didn't really know. I rented a cabin in Zigzag, Oregon, and I didn't go work at the camps or anything. I just moved there. That's when I actually said I was going to go to college. And so I rolled in Mount Hood Community College for one class for that summer. And I went one day and I got in a disagreement, we'll call it, with the professor on something like... And I told him that I was smarter than him and this was a waste of my time and where do I go to get my money back? <laughs> and I never stepped foot in a school again. Knowing you post your jock days, because I didn't know you then, but school, I wouldn't see you as being a great student just because of your opinions and your willingness to share them. It's funny, when I left school though, I had like a 3.6 or 7 GPA. In high school? Yeah, in high school. Yeah, but you went to that like alternative school where you could do whatever you wanted. Oh, even in public school. I just I had a very poor attendance record. I was super book smart. It just was boring. This is not going to be boring, but I'm going to take a break and talk about my sponsors. And my first sponsor is Evo. And with winter right around the corner, it's time to get your gear. And there's no better place to do it than at Evo. Whether you are in one of their stores in Denver, Seattle, or Portland, or online, you will find that Evo has all the brands, an approachable staff, and the best website in the game. Evo is known for being founded by pro skier Bryce Phillips and creating culture in a space where it had started to disappear, and they also give back to local communities. Speaking of giving back, for listening to this show, Evo is going to give you 10% off your entire order. When you check out, enter the code capital TPM, the number 10, no spaces, and you'll get that 10% off when you check out of Evo.com. My next sponsor is Rescue Water, and they are all about proactive recovery. 
What does that mean to you? Well, think of it like this. If you're really tired, you skip the coffee and you grab yourself an energy drink. Well, if you really need to hydrate, like when you're done working out, getting off the mountain, or going to bed after a big night, skip the sports drink and drink a cold rescue water. It replaces electrolytes much better than your traditional sports drink, and it's a difference you can really feel. Make Rescue Water work for you by heading over to rescuewater.com, that's R-E-S-Q water.com, and save 20% on a 12-pack case by entering the code R-E-S-Q water T-P-M. That's all one word. My next sponsor is Outdoor Research, and I've been wearing their outerwear since I moved to Seattle in 2000 because it works better than anything else on the market. It's developed and tested in the Northwest, so you know it's gear you can trust. OR is committed to improving your experience with exceptional product so you don't have to think about your gear while you're out on your journey. But don't just take my word for it. In this year's Powder Magazine Apparel Guide, there was one brand voted Apparel of the Year. It was Outdoor Research. So when you're shopping for outerwear this winter, get the best. Head on over to OutdoorResearch.com and get 15% off your order with the checkout code POWELL, the number 15, all one word, all in caps. Those are my sponsors, so now we'll get back into it. So you're at Hood for the summer. You go to school for a class. You tell the teacher he's an idiot, and you get your money back. Do you move back to Colorado? Because I think there's a few years of shop time for you. Is that before Hood or after? I lived in Colorado one year. I helped write this book. I moved to Hood for three months, and I realized I'm over that up there. And Hood's not a place to live full time, right? It's only a summer thing I figured this out, but I don't know because I'm a kid. Hood was wild that summer. Like, posted the parks all year and met a bunch of crazy hippies and, like, just was a weird kid, you know, had weird neighbors, like typical backwoods hood neighbors. I think one guy maybe grew plants of a sort, you can say. and Like my favorite kind of plants? Yeah, maybe, yeah. And the other neighbors were doing some sketchy shit. Like it was like backwoods already. So I was like, this is not the place for me. So I moved back. I moved to Breck and I moved with a, straight into a condo. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just stopped by and then like, hey, we have extra room for rent here. And so I moved into like an eight by eight loft in Breckenridge. And yeah, I was like, okay, I'm here. Is that when you start working at the shop? You're either at One Track Mind or Big Hit? I was at One Track Mind first for two years. And during that period, that's when I met my girlfriend at the time and my daughter's mother. I was going to ask about this later on, but you had a child really, really young. And yeah. is this right around then? Yeah. So I moved back to Breck and there's this young teenage girl hanging out there and I'm a teenager. And I think she was seeing one of my roommates or whatever, kind of. And I kind of looked at her and I was like, yo, man, she's mine. And that was it. Like, she became my girlfriend right away. And, and we were together, you know. I worked at One Track Mine and we were together for a couple of years. And, and then she got pregnant. And there was never a question if we were going to have a baby or not. Like, A, I was down with her. We were super in love at the time. And just to us, it was like, that wasn't a question. So, yeah, I had a child when I was 20 years old. And that is crazy because, I mean, today, people we know don't have them till like 35. And Mm -hmm. at 20, you've got to be so scared. You're working at a snowboard shop. So it's not like you have a ton of money unless your parents are helping you out or her parents are rich. But are you shitting your pants and excited? And what the hell am I going to do with my life? Yeah, I kind of didn't know. I mean, I was running a snowboard shop. I think right after I had a kid is when I went to go work at Big Hit. And that's when I actually like started becoming a buyer and a manager. So actually, I made like a real income, you know. I wasn't just like an hourly employee. But yeah, I was scared, scared to death, man. I was excited. I remember bringing my daughter home and laying her down on the floor. I was like, well, what do I do now? What do you do with this thing, you know? Yeah. We are two babies raising babies. I was 20 and she was 19 maybe. And we had this little kid and that was it. And obviously, the greatest thing I've ever done in my life is raise my daughter, Skylar, that I couldn't be more proud of and in love with. And she's my best friend now and she's 19. That's amazing. And she lives up in Washington and yeah, she's amazing. So like I said, was it crazy? Yeah, it was absolutely nuts, you know, but it was awesome. It just kind of all happened. At 20, you don't really expect to have that responsibility thrust upon you. And when you do, you still have to have another bit of a life, especially when you're runky. And that's what you are, is like being out and meeting people. So you've got to have a little bit of both, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. And for the next year or two, I I was a buyer, a big hit, and we were trying to raise our daughter. And me and her mom were starting to not get along, which, surprise, surprise, like two teenage kids start dating and have a kid eventually, you know, the odds are not with you to to make it long term, right? Right, for sure. And, you know, there's a lot of really tough times just personally and how we felt about each other. Just 
and nothing bad. Like me and my daughter's mom to this day are, are, are good friends. And so we weren't always though. It kind of had fallen apart, man. Like life had gotten pretty bad. It was like, what am I going to do? I can't do this. This relationship's not working. I can get her out of here. I need to raise a daughter. I had some opportunities to be a rep and I didn't want to do that. And so I think long story short, I moved my daughter and her mother to Kansas City. And we all moved back to be with my folks just because I was like, I need some help. I don't know what's going on. And I moved them home and my parents were like supportive. And I was just like, I was at home in Kansas for like a month. And I was like, all right, they're safe here. Like my daughter's safe. And her mom's kind of being looked after by my parents a little bit for help. And I packed up like three bags of clothes. And I think I had $3,000. And I drove to California knowing one, one person and knowing that if I wanted to really get into this industry, like really get like get a job in the industry, I had to go to Southern California. So I just packed up and I was like, all right, mom, dad, you need to help look after them. I'm like, I got to go. Like, here's some money for them. Like, I've got this. I'm out of here. And I was 21 or 22, 22 maybe. Whoa. So you left your girlfriend and daughter with your parents? Well, me and my girlfriend had pretty much broken up, right? It was more like make sure that they're safe and they have a place to live and stuff like that. But we're not together anymore, you know, or it's not good. And so I got them settled in Kansas City. Then I left and I moved to California by myself. You go to California with the manifest destiny of move west and you'll make things better by surrounding yourself with your industry. And I don't know if the first gig you get is with Velvet Version or V2 or whatever it is, but you end up there eventually. That was like within like five months of moving there. Like I moved to California, I think within the first week or two, I knew a couple of people, right? I knew this guy named Travis he used to work at one track with and he was maybe working at Nixon. I stayed with him for a little bit. He knew someone, that, I knew someone that was another car kid that was at like swell.com and it was like some skate thing too. It was like an online big, like a CCS. So right away I have a job as a customer service there. It's horrible, right? I'm in a call center, but I got to do that for three months and whatever. I only know like a handful of people and I'm with someone I know and we're going to the office of Virgin of Velvet Recon that was at the time independent. And I walk in with a friend of mine that was going to go visit this friend that worked there and I was pretty hungover and like, whatever, I'm just cruising. I don't know anyone in California still, you know, or very few people. And the owner of that company walks out of his office he sees me and he's like oh he knew me when i was a buyer at big hit right okay i had met him the first year they launched and he's like what are you doing here i was like i don't know i'm just cruising i'm trying to figure it out he's like come talk to me so we go sit in his conference room or his office and talk they're small and they also it was was a company that failed even after k2 bought it it failed or they got rid of it but at the time it was it was doing all right and he's like i walked out in his office to shoot the shit with him and i came out as the team and marketing manager which i didn't know what that was (laughs) And I think he paid me like $34,000 a year. And I was like, oh, I'm rich. Right. This is awesome. And I knew nothing. Like, Team Edge was, was still in the beginning of this. You know, this is still pretty new, right? It's like early 2000s, but I didn't know what I was doing. And these industries aren't like Fortune 500 companies. When you get in there and you're the marketing manager and team manager back that early in the company, it's like, all right, so what are you going to do, Ryan? Yeah, no, I literally made up what I did every day at work. Literally, I was making it up every single day trying to figure out what to do like and then we're going to buy ads and then we're going to go shoot ads and then I'm going to deliver I remember delivering ads to Transworld on like a CD like with the final ad driving it there because we were so late like here it is on a CD this is it (laughs) print this put it in the magazine and like so rogue and I met some amazing people working there like some amazing talented athletes like I worked with Jeremy Jones for a long time we started recon he's still a friend of mine today and Jana Mayan was on Velvet, one of the best female snowboarders in the world ever to this day, I'd say. And I traveled with her for years. And she was actually like in my wedding when I ended up getting married down the road. And I met my best friend through that this day, Eli. Like, it's kind of the start of it all. Velvet was cool. I don't I don't know if Version was ever cool. Version was not cool. And so we started Recon with Jeremy and Mitch Nelson. I don't know if Recon ever did much. I didn't. It, Katie bought it and merged it back to the Virgin name. The whole thing was a cluster. You're there, Velvet's cool, you're trying to build Recon, and then K2 comes in, and it's K2 Inc., and they buy the brand, and it seems like, to me, because I was with K2 at that time, and it was Dick Heckman was the head of K2, his son comes in and helps drive Velvet Inversion into the ground, I think, but you were there, how does that whole thing play out? Well, it was kind of weird, like, K2 came and bought it and gave us some life, right? We're like, okay, we got some structure behind us, right? And... It was K2 Inc. and Carlsbad that also, like, so we were kind of merged with Audio and Planet Earth. Yep. And that was going on. But then they moved to KG Sports, and that's when Mavis became my boss. So Mavis is trying to run this brand from Seattle. We're down in California. And I think there's, like, one trade show cycle. So I think I was there for, like, two years. It sounds really long, but it happened pretty quick, a couple years, the whole thing, you know? And then 
it was kind of falling apart. I think it was going to be done. And I remember I got offered a job by a sports agent as an assistant. And I was like, all right, that's what I'm going to go do. And I remember having a phone call with Scott Mavis to quit. To get a hold of your boss when he lived in Washington, and he was really busy, you know, Mave. Yep. And the greatest guy ever. And I was like, man, this is going to be horrible. Mave is the guy that always had my back. And I had to quit. And he calls me and he offers me a job as a K2 team manager, K2 team manager. And I was like, uh, what? And I'm about to quit. And he, he's offered me a job up in Seattle. So I literally had to hang up on him and call him back. So I was like, I got to call you back and think about this. And that job for you, because at this point in your life, you've already transitioned into like runky from like yeah. your high school days to now, you're covered in tattoos black hair. You're the dude who's out. I think at this point you're smoking cigarettes, although you've quit four and a half years ago. Congratulations on that. But you were just like the runky and you had a persona. And when people saw you, they expected one thing. It was almost like you were a character. And then when K2 offers you a gig, it's totally anti-runky. I mean, you're, you're looking at a corporation who at that time is a little bit different maybe than they are today. But it seems like different values and a dude that looks like you looked at that point would want to embrace. So it had to be a tough decision to take the K2 job, leave California and head up to the rain. I didn't expect it. I think I talked to Maeve about like, what's the future here, right? Like, what's what am I doing at this company? You know, because it was all kind of multiple brands, but all kind of emerging to K2 Sports, which if you know or don't know, or you can explain better, Mike, because you were there forever. It, It ran multiple brands under one umbrella for a long time, right? Yep. The higher bosses crossed over quite a bit. And then there's like small armies of people trying to be cool for the brand, whatever, you know. And so it kind of came out of left field, but I just, I guess I gut checked myself. I was like, this seems like the right opportunity for me to like really put my feet down, like establish doing some stuff with the brands. Because I still didn't really understand the snowboard industry. I was only truly in it for like a couple of years on that side. And I was still learning my way through everything, you know. I'm sure you have to learn Excel, Outlook, everything from the ground up because you're education wise. You didn't have to learn that shit in college because you took a different route. So everything came new at Velvet Version. But when you go to K2, that's where I think your college education happens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just called him back the next day. I was like, all right, I'm in. When I started, he's like, you need to be here in two weeks. I was like, excuse me? And I don't think I showed up for like six weeks. I think I procrastinated because I really didn't want to leave California, but I wanted the job. So whatever, fast forward, I I don't take the job I was going to quit for. I have to call them back and say, hey, listen, I had this opportunity to come up. I, I can't pass it up. I feel like it's the right decision for me to go do this. And so I move up to Seattle. And that's when I met you and a lot of other people up there. Yeah. And I would say your first maybe six months at K2, I wouldn't think you would have liked Seattle at that point, because I think you were quiet and kind of in your own world, because not that we were all different, but we might have all looked different and you might have had a different attitude. Eventually, after like six months, everything came together and everybody hung out. Do you remember that phase of Runky, that first six months out there? Well, yeah, I think I was kind of on my own program for sure. Like I didn't really know anyone. And then I came up and I started in the summer or fall or something like that. I'm not sure when. Maybe it was the fall. And remember, I'm still raising my daughter four or five months a year. In the summertime, my daughter's with me. So I'm like, I'm raising a kid on my own. So I moved to Seattle and pretty right away, I have a kid. She's going to daycare today when I'm working. I'm having to travel some. I was trying to figure out how to keep my life afloat because it wasn't just a job stuff or trying to find new friends. And the best part about taking that job is Daniel Hamilton, he had the chance to be the marketing manager at the time. Me and her were good friends from Colorado. She was being offered the K2 marketing manager job. I was being offered the team manager job. And we were both on the phone like, well, are you going to do it? Well, are you going to do it? Well, I'll do it if you do it. And Lydia, we had this conversation, me and Daniel, like on the phone, like, all right, if you do it, I do it. I think that's probably what sold me because I was going to go work with Danielle and she was one of my close friends, you know? Yep. That was my support system. Like I knew Danielle and she was amazing too. She used to help me look after my daughter. Like when I had to go on the road, like she was rad. Without her, I would not have probably pulled it all off, you know, or it would have been near as easily. I would have always pulled off because that's kind of how I am. But she was definitely integral in that first little bit moving up there. In terms of the job, it's a different animal than your velvet version days because you're walking into budgets where you've had budgets that are bigger later on in your career. But when you walk into a budget of almost a million dollars when you get to K2, I would think... That's got to be amazing to you and scary because you have to manage the budget. But I'm guessing if you went over, you went over, fire me later. Who cares? I have no idea what they were like. But it was a like legit team. It was like Vile and it was Bobby Meeks. Gretchen Blather was there. And I was trying to prove myself to those people. And I think but also then I'd already have that job. People started to realize our athletes tried to have to like get on my good side. You know, it's like that kind of pendulum switch. Yeah. Where like I was trying to be legit what I did. Does that make sense? Yeah. You were in a position where 
you were good at what you're doing, but it also wielded power. There had to be some respect there as well. Yeah. The K2 years, the two and a half years I was there, was a blast. I met really good people. Like I said, that group from K2 Skis and K2 Snowboards and Ride Snowboards, like it all kind of merged together. We all came a really good group of friends, right? Those last years on Vashon, for sure. Yeah, whatever. Because I, when I left K2, I was still on Vashon on that stupid ferry every day. Yep. It wasn't always awesome up there. Like, I don't think some people at K2 definitely liked me that much. <laughs> some of the upper people, but I kind of always did what, once again, I, I'm not saying it's for good or bad. And not that I was trying to be a pain in the ass people, but I kind of push buttons a lot of times. And I guess I always kind of have, but it always worked out for me, you know, like never meant to disrespect anyone, but I was just like, I would get cocky sometimes. Like I noticed right here, I'd be a pain in the ass. I try to stir the pot a bit because I still believe that snowboarding was this cool thing. You're allowed to stir the pot. And I didn't want to fully conform and like, let's have fun. And that was my mentality. When you're so close to it, you're traveling with the athletes and you have your finger on the pulse. Then you step into a meeting and people are telling you what snowboarding needs. You're not going to sit there and listen. You're going to let them know what it really needs. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to put it. What are your highlights at K2? Oh, man, I don't know. I don't feel like there's any really big projects there, you know? I think that I did a lot of stuff later on. Was it more just that was college for you then? It was college for me, yeah. I think that's it. And I was traveling. You know, this first time I was really starting to travel the world and get to go to a lot of cool places. And I started to pick up a camera at K2 and started shooting photos. And that was really fun because it was like it gave me a creative outlet. And I guess a highlight, I mean, I met my, my now ex-wife at K2. And so that was a highlight because it was a really important time in my life, you know? And I would say that was a weird one to me because when you looked at your ex-wife and yourself, when you were dating, it was your complete opposites, it looked like. When I met my ex-wife for the first time, and she worked at K2, I didn't like her. But shortly after, we were out one night on some K2 event, and it just clicked. But you're right. You wouldn't never put money on on paper. The odds of that one, it was kind of baffling to people, I think. Myself included. I'll talk about one other K2 thing. I heard there was a story that there was a team dinner at a sales meeting. And then <laughs> when you guys got to the sales meeting, shit really hit the fan. I believe you were there. And what happened? Yeah, I would say that there was some big global sales thing. And I don't know how it started, but maybe we were having too much fun. And maybe we were all kind of... Yeah, you have a lot of drinks at sales meetings. That's kind of what happens. Yeah, and I think that I just opened my mouth and it didn't go so well. Man, I don't even want to talk about this. Maybe the whole team stood up and walked out because I told them all to and it didn't go over so well. But at the end of the day, like, I didn't get fired for it, actually. But they were not happy with me. And I think I was just super over the... I don't know why. Maybe we'd all just been partying too much. So that's probably it. Yeah, well, I heard it was uh, an amazing dinner and amazing aftermath. And that is going to take us to a sponsor break. And my next sponsor is Spy Optic. And they have been independent since 94 and taking a playful approach to everything they create. They're killing it on the innovation game this season with their new electrochromic one lens technology. If you haven't heard about the Ace EC goggle, it packs the power of three lenses into one by changing tints with the touch of a button. It's crazy innovation that creates one goggle for any light. It's the best goggle on the market, period. Check out spyoptic.com for all the details on the game-changing EC, as well as their newest athlete signature models and sunglasses. For listening to the show, the good folks at Spy are going to give you 20% off their entire site. When you check out of their site, use the code capital TPM, the number 20, all one word at checkout, and you will get that 20% off. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery based out of Bend, Oregon. They are all about drinking beer outside and supporting snow sports and culture. And this year, they are doing something that no beer has ever done before. Not only are they creating a Pray for Snow lager, they've produced their own ski and snowboard film, Pray for Snow, featuring riders like Ben Ferguson, Eric Jackson, and Lucas Walks. They are truly giving back to snow culture, and you should truly give back to them by drinking their beer preferably a lot of it. To find out more about the movie tour, beers, and pubs, head on over to tenbarrel.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's head back into the life of Runky. 
you decide it's time to move on. You've done all you can do at K2, and I don't know how you were offered the job with Rome, but you end up working with Rome and moving to Vermont, managing team and marketing over there, a brand that's much more fitting to the runky persona. Yeah. It was the last one I was in Seattle, so I guess the second or third one, I don't know what it was, and I wanted to get married. I was going to get engaged, and I left. I was on the road for like four months straight almost, right? So I was shooting, I was driving trucks, sled the whole nine, right? So I was not really coming home during the winter months. And I remember my ex at time, I'm on the road, and she's like, I took a job at Burton, I moved to Vermont. So I'm like, whoa. And so a month later, I fly out to Vermont to see her, and that's where I proposed to her. And I was like, listen, I she was more important to me than K2. So. I got engaged. I will work out the west of the winter to like April or May and I'll move to Vermont with you. So I moved to Vermont, like no job. Bought a house with my ex. We were living in the country and I didn't have a job when I got there. I didn't have a job with Burton. I didn't have a job with Rome. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I just said that was it. I, I made that, that gut call that she was more important and um, that was the right call. And I was pretty much over K2. So I picked up and I left and I moved. And I was in Vermont for a couple of weeks. I'm not happy. I mean, I wasn't ever happy about moving from Vermont, especially like I got there. I was like, what am I doing here? This is the middle of nowhere. Like I'm not an East Coast kid. Like I'm definitely a West Coast person, whatever. I, I adjust to it. And I know people at Burton. I know people at Rome. And I started talking to Josh Reed. And I think it was about a month later, two months into work at, at Rome that Josh gave me a job as a uh, global marketing manager. So I ran team. I ran all marketing. I ran it globally. I ran all trade shows. I helped oversee all the stuff in Europe. You name it. Me and the team, we had a, such a rad team at Rome. And this is like probably the f- most proud I am at snowboarding. It's the four years I spent at Rome with Paddock and Joel and Josh and Paul and Sully and Cabin and that whole crew. There's more than I'm forgetting. But I mean, we made snowboarding awesome, man, in our minds at least. And I think the brand was pretty small then. And Rome went on a pretty big growth spurt too, right? It went pretty large. Yeah. I, I was there in the Hades, right? Like it was small. This was a family. I loved it. I loved it for a while. You know, every job eventually you don't love, but it was raw. We did whatever we wanted. Our goal was just piss people off. The difference between the brands, if you look at like mainstream mall chain stores, K2 was your Abercrombie and you became the hot topic. Can we do something better than hot topic? That's kind of harsh, man. I think the wrong guys are kicking ass when you say that. I don't know. I just came up with something. Yeah, for sure. I'll give it to you. And we'll leave that. Everyone will kick my ass to this day for saying that. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. They probably kick my ass too. At one point, you said that it was nice to go work for a real snowboard company. What does that mean? It was a snowboard company. It was Josh and Paul, the owners, were real snowboarders. Every person in that building loved snowboarding and snowboard a lot. It was raw. It was gritty. There was nothing fancy. It was real snowboarding. I mean, we were drinking Jack Daniels in the office and had a shitty mini ramp outside that I think we lit on fire at one point in time. Like It's like snowboarding in the like 90s when like everyone hated us type of approach, you know? Like when we Rome started one of their anti Nike campaigns when Nike launched, we did the the collab with Consolidate, the Don't Do It campaign. Yeah, I think we brought in fifty people to picket the Nike booth at SIA. Like I paid kids to come picket the Nike booth at SIA for four days straight. <laughs> That's when we started making the Rome movies. Like we made Any Means and No Crack Way and those first couple of raw team movies and snowboarding that I got to work on and be the producer on. And Transwo did the team shootout. It was Rome versus Form versus DC versus. Burton, I guess. And we had one resort, two filmers, and X amount of days to film this thing. And that was like an MTV show. And, you know, we were the underdogs. We were like the redhead stepchild of snowboarding, too, still. And our team was good, but we weren't the Form 8, right? And we weren't the Burton guys. We weren't DC with all their money. And we were just raw. And we ended up winning that thing. And really kind of trying to show everyone that, like, we will outwork you and we snowboard harder than you. And this is our team riders, but even our filmers and everyone of the brand, like, we would outwork everyone, right? That was a point there, that sense of urgency and to be the best and to outwork people because Snowboard Industries has always been a grind to grow a brand, you know? Yeah, I mean, the Rome days were amazing, man. Like, I, I slept so many days in that office. It was a family, you know? Like, it was pretty cool. It was stressful, but it was cool. And we have themes and our goals. I mean, I think I got, I was at Rome for trade shows for four years. Every single year at one point, the SIA guys would come over like, dude, you're out of here. And personally, because I, I ran all the trade shows too, so... I think they used to kick me out. I'd walk out the front door, go home, take a break, and come back two hours in the back door and be right back in the show. That was our approach, right? Like Our approach was to cause trouble there. Yeah. I was given that direction, or that was our direction. We are here to make a scene. And that's when trade shows mattered, and every buyer and everyone was there. You know, like Those were the Vegas trade show days. 
in recent news, Rome, I think, was sold to Nidecker a few weeks back. And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't really have an opinion on that. If it worked out good for them, for Josh and Paul and the people there, that's awesome then, you know? Whatever works for them is great. What makes you want to leave Vermont? Is it the relationship or is it just time to get out or is it Red Bull? Why do you leave? I never loved Vermont, right? I feel like it was a four-year prison sentence. Okay. I mean, I met some cool people there, but it just wasn't my deal. And I don't know exactly how it happened, but a friend of mine that I knew from the road from the last bit year worked at Red Bull. And Red Bull was trying to refocus their snow sites. They didn't really have someone running snow. And so I got a call from them. And basically, Red Bull called me to ask me if I want to come and help be a national athlete manager. So help run some of their athletes nationally, but specifically snow and to work on this one film project called Art of Flight. I haven't heard of that movie. Yeah, it's, it's a small one. Yep. I got hired by Red Bull. And I mean, what Red Bull can offer you compared to what, like, A, Vermont's cheap to live in, but I was getting paid pretty good at Rome. But like, what Red Bull could offer me and the opportunity to go work for like a billion dollar brand and talk about managing budgets, it was a no brainer. So they came to me and my job was to manage Sean White, Travis Rice, a handful of others, and then work on this movie project called Art of Flight. So that is the dream job of every under 24 person in the entire world. But I'm well over 24 at this point. Yeah, but you can't do that job when you're that young. I mean, it's a dream job of that person, but you can't do it. You just don't have the experience or the knowledge of of what needs to happen. But in making the art of flight, what's your role behind the scenes? Because I see you're an executive producer, but what are you actually doing? I manage Travis, right? So I manage all stuff with Travis. I hired the person to build all the marketing identity, the logoing the packaging, the, you name it, right? We named the movie. I was just kind of, so me, Red Bull works with Media House and they like were kind of run the production budget, but then the marketing budget just runs through sports market at the time. So the whole global tour, the whole nine, like how we're going to roll this thing out was my role. So it's more than just athletes. I went on one shoot for that whole movie, but then I, I was on like over 30 stops on the tour or something. Yeah, you're making the tour happen in every detail. Yeah, and the branding and the marketing and the name. Sports marketing ran that side of it, right? Yep. So that's where my role was. And yeah, bringing in the tour manager the whole nine. Was that two years of your life focused on that movie? I came in like June to start working. And then the following September is when it premiered. So that kind of went till December. So you came in after it was shot. The movie had shot partially. And there was a whole other year of cycle shooting. And then the editing and the whole tour. So I was like, I'd say like the project was like about 18 months of my life. Red Bull creates a ton of opportunities, like you said. And what's the coolest thing that you were able to do with Red Bull that you never thought you'd be able to do in your life? You name it. I can't be more thankful for my years at Red Bull. It was such an amazing time. I was given such opportunity. And I slowly just kept taking on more and more. Like I ended up running all skate for a while, running all BMX for a while, running all snowboarding. So, man, there's so many opportunities. I got to see so many amazing places. I lived on an airplane. I think the Art of Flight tour year, I was on the road like 260 days or something like that. 240 days on the road, something ridiculous. Do you still like doing that? Not near as much anymore, and I don't travel that much anymore. I still travel a lot, but not like that. No way. Even then, you were still in your 30s, I would think, or early 30s when that's happened. Early 30s. That's a lot of time to be traveling. Yeah. And then money-wise in life, have you done pretty well so far? I mean, with Red Bull, I'm, I'm imagining you're making pretty good money. I'm not rich, but I live an all right life. I support my daughter in college, and yeah, whatever. You got a house? I don't own a house right now, actually. I do not. I would love to buy a house in Hermosa Beach where I live, Redondo, but it's about $1.5 million to do that just to get into something. And I don't really have that sitting around right now. So it's just really expensive here, you know? Yeah. And so I've kind of just, yeah, I do fine. Everything's great. You know, I've I've got a great lifestyle. I'm really happy and I work really hard. and I've been blessed. I've had a lot of opportunities, but I've tried to take advantage of everyone to make the most out of it, you know? Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. Like every step of my life has been a stepping stone. And I always saw everything as like, this takes me to here. Because I moved a lot, right? Like I I moved from Colorado to San Diego, San Diego, Seattle, Seattle, Vermont, Vermont, back to California. But I moved every time for a work base, right? Pretty much. So I always had to make those sacrifices to stay ahead. Where now I don't see myself moving ever again. Like I'll be in this general area, right? From San Diego to LA for the rest of my life, I'd say. Eventually, you transition out of Red Bull and you decide to become an agent. And I don't know if you're recruited to become an agent, but it makes sense because you have so much history with athletes in the action sports world. And it's not just an area where an agent who's on the team sports side can walk in and say, hey, I'm going to work with you because there has to be a respect level. You have to understand the game and you have a lot of history in doing that. 
And I would think some of the athletes are refreshed by the fact that you look a little bit different than a lot of the agents out there. And that's a good thing. You look more like them than you do like a corporate agent type. Does that help you? Yeah, I think so. But you got to look at some of the best agents in the snowboard side, right? I mean, credit to Steve Aspen. He came from snowboarding, right? He was the original Lamar team manager. And Steve Ruff and Ninja, like both pro riders and came up in that world, you know. But yeah, athletes want someone they can connect with, right? It's about having connection, trusting someone. And then having someone that has those personal relationships that can balance all sides of it, I guess. And you just have to love it, right? If you try to become an agent to make money in this space, you're going to fail. You've got to truly love it. If you love it, you'll be successful. That stands for a lot of things. But you can make money doing what you do. I mean, you wouldn't be there if you couldn't do well. 100%. And it all depends on the athletes and what happens. And I was going to talk about your first agency days, but we're running short on time. So you did a stint at an agency before this, but right now you are the managing director of Action Sports and Olympic at Evolution Management and Marketing. And that's a mouthful right there. Yeah. Evolution's really small, though. Like, I could write whatever title I could change my head on five times a day. There's honestly three main people there. It's the founder, Brian Samuels, which is the most amazing person I've ever got to be partners with or work with in my life. And Tom Yaps, that I've known forever, has been there for 10 years. And there used to be another partner that's no longer there, but there was like three of them forever. And then they brought me in and, and now it's just three of us, but we've got a couple of assistants and a couple of other junior agents and it's very boutique and everyone works really hard. All three of us see eye to eye, right? We all work really, really, really hard and we all don't take anything for granted. So my model hasn't ever changed, right? My model's like, I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room and never have been, never will be. The reason I think anything done been successful is because work ethic, right? I will outwork anyone and I'll work longer hours. And I will balance how to keep working while I'm out being social. It just comes down to actually really loving what you do and, and outworking people, I guess. And being honest to people. I try to really be honest to my clients and everyone and not be sneaky, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right word. I think that's a good word is you want to be transparent, non-sneaky, but then also working for your client when you're working with other people. But this year was a crazy fucking year for you. You had Red Gerard. He wins a gold medal at the Olympics. I think the first gold medal at the Olympics. Correct. My favorite part of all of this Olympics had nothing to do with the competition, was just his family getting Gerard. That was the funniest thing I saw throughout the entire Olympics. But for you being an agent, when you have an, an athlete like that who, I don't know if he was expected to do as well as he did, but he wins this medal. And all of a sudden, he's on. You got to strike while the iron's hot. You're getting a million phone calls a day. What does your life look like in the the days and weeks after the Olympics because your client achieved his goals? First of all, it was, yeah, highlight of my life. It was a pretty amazing experience to be with the whole family and to be there and to be with Red. He was an underdog, right? For him just to make the Olympics was a goal. That was our goal. Like, let's just make the Olympics and go there. And then when he got to the Olympics, like, let's just go make a final and go there. And he ended up qualifying first. And we're like, all right, we got a shot here. But everyone's seen it, right? It was amazing. And the media story, the Gerards and the 18 people they brought there. And when he says fuck on TV, which actually isn't even him saying fuck on TV. It's someone else saying fuck. So, yeah, it wasn't even him. And just the whole thing, it it was chaos. And we had a plan in place. And I was there with Tom Yaps. I was there with my assistant, Ann Jackson, and the whole family. And I had other clients here. And Red's got his brother, Malachi, that's kind of like his road manager. Because being young, you need someone to travel with them all the time. And obviously, I can't be everywhere. So it was nuts. The next couple of months were nuts. For Red especially, but even for myself, we were multiple trips to New York. And we were invited to the Oscars and to the ESPYs. And shot a commercial for Mountain Dew. And a ton of other things we turned down. He, went, he was a guest at the PJ Championships down in Florida. I mean, you name it. We shot for Golf Digest. It's been a pretty crazy ride. It's not over yet for him. You know, there's still more stuff going on. It's one of those things where in 20 years, if he wants, he's going to be able to get paid four grand to speak at something because he was a gold medalist. He wasn't a silver. He won the gold. And obviously, I've been to a couple other cycles of Olympics, one other, as an agent. This is the first time I've ever had a client win a medal or especially a gold medal. So it was definitely eye-opening. Like, it's, it's life-changing for these kids. It is absolutely life-changing for them. And it's a, such an amazing experience that hopefully I'll get to repeat multiple times during my career. And what was the dumbest or most ridiculous media request that you received? Oh, man. I mean, I can't even keep them straight. There's so many, so many media requests and so many things. I don't know what the dumbest one was. I mean, the coolest, I think, is when he went on Kimmel, you know? I think that's the coolest stuff. That's not dumb, though. No, that's, uh, that's something anybody wants to do. But nobody wants to pose with animals in a zoo. But did the Japanese ask for that? 
we had some random small things like he got offered to judge like a sand sculpture contest and something like no like we're not doing that there's some random stuff out of left field right like i honestly i I don't have that answer loaded for you i'm sorry i should have been prepped i'd rather you not be prepped and ryan i normally end these things with inappropriate questions and i have some for you okay let's go i'll give you what i can okay and these aren't bad they're all kind of work related because i knew you didn't want to go too far off the script so i didn't Thank you. You're welcome. So you've been in a lot of situations where I think uh, you're working with people that don't understand snowboarding. And, and usually in those cases, it's, it's some kind of outside media and they're going to represent the sport wrong in the long run. What's the worst case of this that you've seen and you've had to step in and be like, no, you don't know what you're talking about? I think the biggest issue you see with that stuff is when you get around the Olympic stuff, you have to be careful what corporate deals you're doing because you want to make sure you keep some control because... I mean, we could all go back to the guy in the sky, the Getty images, the type of stuff that the magazines put out that are just like so crazy. It doesn't even show. So they, they call tricks wrong, stuff like that. Yep. It's the mainstream media that you have to literally handhold and approve photos because they will put the dumbest things out there. There's such a bad representation of our sport. And the problem is that half the photographers of the Olympics are, are, they've never shot somewhere in their life, right? Why don't you stick a fast photographer in the cold and let them try to go shoot somewhere? They don't know what they're doing. And unfortunately, that still needs to be fixed, right? When it comes to Olympic snowboarding and that big ticket or that big table or that big platform, you know? Yeah, they need to do what Red Bull does and create a great portal where all the images are and people can pull from them. And Getty Images is not it. Question number two is, there was a time when you were the party. I mean, everybody was stoked to see Runky when he showed up and everybody knew it was going to be a big night. Now, this might be in your past, but what is the most trouble that you've gotten in on a work trip? Oh, man, super loaded. I would say it would have been something in my Red Bull days. I think there's probably multiple opportunities at the Red Bull days. That, trouble's a vague word, right? Yeah. Like, good trouble. Like, no one's really in trouble. I'd say at the Red Bull days, there's a large handful of times that we push the envelope and me with other people from Red Bull and athletes of what we could get away with, and the company still accept it. Miami, San Diego for New Year's Eve, a lot of X Games days at the Debbie Hotel in LA. I'll leave those ones out there. Those three are some good examples of some pretty heavy, heavy party situations. They're pretty heavy, pushing the limits. And now one totally different. So you're an agent. You see the deals from behind the scenes. I have a podcast. I have women on this podcast a lot. And when I do, we talk about how women don't make as much as men in snowboarding or any other sport for that matter. Now, you're the guy that makes money happen. The brand pulls the number up and you negotiate it. But why don't women make as much as men in action sports? There's some cases they're starting to. I think it's really rad to see people like WSL just did it, but respect to Jake and Donna Carpenter for always making the U.S. open the snowboarding equal prize money. They've been done that forever, so I'd like to give credit to them on that. I think that you're actually seeing a shift because maybe it's not as many women are getting paid, but there's some of the women are starting to make as much money now because... Female, Gen Z, that client out there, that's who's buying stuff. And so it's starting to flip. Why in the past? I don't know. But even when I was at my Rome days, like Marie Francois, we took care of very fairly. At Red Bull, there's women there get taken care of very fairly. More than a lot of guys. I don't think it's as bad as people think. I think there's fewer females getting paid. But that marketplace, there's just as many women out there as there's men too. Now, these used to be what? I don't really even work in skateboarding that much, but like there was like three skateboard girls, you know, now there's a lot of women in the skateboard that are really good. And in every sport, surfing, women's surfing is so powerful, you know, and women somewhere, there's as many pro women somewhere, there's almost as many women as there is men, you know, like if you go to a contest, you'll see almost equally as many women in the contest that are at top level. You know, hopefully in 10 years, we might see it almost be 50-50, you know, pretty dead even. Okay. And there's a lot more women in the space, working in the space, and they're smart and they're intelligent. I mean, back to the company days, right? How am I at Rome supposed to market to teenage girls, right? That's a horrible, I don't know how to do that. You need to have people that understand the space, right? So I like to see it becoming very equal and very gentrified, maybe the word, or just, yeah, gentrified. It's open opportunity for everyone out there. One of the smartest people I've ever worked for in my life was Amy Taylor, which is the vice president of Red Bull. And I think she's back in that role again. First time I met her, I was like, wow, that's the smartest person I've ever sat and talked to. So I really don't think it's as bad. And I think it's getting more and more equal every year. As it should. I just wanted to know your thoughts as you are the guy who's making the deals. Ryan, I want to thank you for your time, man. It's been cool knowing you for almost 15 years now. But in hearing your story, I mean, I would have never taken you for a jock in high school. And you're 
path has been untraditional, like you said, but it's all about work ethic. Like you work harder than everybody else. And that's at the office, at the bar, everywhere you're going. You're making friends, making connections, and that's why you're so successful. So thanks for your time, dude. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. So that was time with Ryan Runke, and he proves that you don't need to go the traditional route to find success. While I still think college is a great way to find your path, Ryan's story proves that it's not the only way. For Ryan, he lived the snowboard bum life until he realized that he wasn't going to be a bum. Yeah, he was going to live that lifestyle harder than anyone, but he was going to make a career out of it. And while he may not have had the knowledge in his brain when he was younger, he's a people person who will outwork you. And that work ethic and his personality, combined with a lot of things falling into place, is why Ryan Runke is where he is today. Now, it's time for me to ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on. Thanks ahead of time, as that is greatly appreciated. What's also appreciated is emails of what you think or want on the show. My email is mike at thepowellmovement.com, and I will get back to you, unless you're trying to sell me something. Then I'll either ask for whatever you're trying to sell me for free or ignore you completely. Finally, I want to thank my sponsors for making the show happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, Outdoor Research, Spy Optic, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.